Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Paul has been a member, I think a member from the beginning of the Zumbro <laughs> Book, years. book reading club, is that right? Small group book club? I don't think it's been a hundred years. <laughs> um, that group started with a small group of people, I believe, studying who were, had a joint interest in science fiction. And the book at, uh, study group has continued to this day, and Paul has been a member. And he's going to share with us today some of the uh, books that uh, he, we have encountered in the book group and some ideas about the book club. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Harlan. One of the really good things about having the book study group is been getting to know Harlan a lot better. Thank you all for being here. We'll see what happens. I, Harlan was a little bit generous with the, Paul said he'd love to come and present it, but <laughs> it's more like Paul thinks maybe it should be brought up to people he really would rather not be standing up there, but we'll try to get along okay anyway. So, I'm hoping to make your time worthwhile with a couple things. One is just a collection of tips for forming and, and working with a small group, just to try to make it easier since we've had this experience over the last eight years of, of having a small group book study. And then I'd like to introduce you to what I consider to be a bunch of great books. Certainly our personal preferences vary widely, and so you may not think some of these books are very great, but hopefully you'll come away with one or two ideas for books that you'd like to read. And of course the overall theme is really to just encourage you to read and discuss books. We should have time for questions as we go along. I may defer them if I'm about to cover it with the way I've walked through it in the past, but otherwise feel free to let me know if you have questions. So to have a small group, there are a number of ingredients. You have to have a reason for forming one, and we'll talk more about each of these. You have to put it together to begin with. You choose a meeting frequency. How do you decide to choose books? How do you host it? What are the group member responsibilities? Discussion approaches and then the whole idea of building relationships through working with the books. So why a small group? First of all, you have a lot more ideas for books when you combine a bunch of people. We all run into book ideas from reviews or references and other books that we've read, but you get a really a good multiplier effect when you have a group of people get together and that can all provide candidates for the group to read. <coughs> a huge benefit, I think, is really deeper learning. Um, you may read a book, think you got a tremendous amount out of it, and yet someone else's perspective will add something that you had never seen, and then the act of actually discussing it brings out perspectives and ideas that no individual had had. So you really get that benefit by having the group discussion. Fellowship is another important part of the small group. And I'll use our small group as, a, as, a, as an example, not because you should run it that way or that it'll work the same way for you, but, but just to give you an idea of kind of a real life kind of situation. As I mentioned, I've gotten to know Harlan. Um, number of group members in the audience, Sue and Bob Jenkins, have been uh, some of the original folks here, too. And you, when you spend time with meaningful discussions and then regular time with people, it, it just really helps to develop a much more meaningful relationship than you can have even seeing them every Sunday for five minutes. I really like small groups compared to large groups because then everyone can contribute more easily. Not everybody appreciates that, and I think I saw Bob Morse earlier. Um, yeah, Life has a discussion of great books, which I think is a little larger group. That might be another way to get involved with group discussions. But with a small group, you also have more meeting place options, because if your group is smaller, of course, you can fit into you know, any number of rooms. 
So if you think of smart forming a small group, uh, look for others who share topical interests. As Harlan mentioned, we started with a science fiction and Bible study combination and kind of expanded from there to more biographies, heroes and leaders, and then really reached the point where we thought, well, just any book that we thought the group would like is a good candidate for a discussion. And we'll talk more about how we choose books later. You also want to agree as a group on your preferred reading amount and frequency. I know some groups will read a book chapter and discuss it, and they might meet weekly or monthly. Um, our group has chosen to read a book per month and discuss the book in one, in one meeting. And so you need to just kind of agree with that. If, if you really don't want to read that much or don't have that much time available, then just work with a group that isn't as anxious to, to zip through books. Decide on a group size. Talked a little bit about that. It affects the amount of interactions that you have. And it can change over time. Well, we started with quite a large group with the, the science fiction group. And you'll find that people have other priorities that they'll develop. And so you can start with more than an ideal number, and you can expect the group will ebb and flow over time. An important one is how you will coordinate the group and how you should communicate. You don't have to have everybody on email or text or something like that, but it really makes it easier for the coordinator to be able to send one thing out to the whole group rather than calling people individually when you're trying to set up meetings and such. And so it's just something to talk about ahead of time. Again, as we go through this, if you haven't already realized, there's going to be nothing earth chattering here, but hopefully it's just the collection of things that you don't have to stop and think about on your own to get started. So how often should you meet? Again, ours is monthly, but then we skip once, like December, in fact, because we tend to meet the last Tuesday of the month. And so that doesn't fit in very well with holiday schedules. And then we also vary our meetings sometimes. When Zumbro has a small group kind of focus for a while, sometimes we'll suspend our small group so that people aren't tied up with too much to do at one time. You certainly want to leave time to obtain and read the book, whether you're checking a book out of the library or you're ordering it. So if you're going to meet weekly and read a book per week, um, then you better have your schedule set long in advance so that you have the books you know, well before that. Otherwise, um, and I guess we'll talk more later about how we've typically done it, just to, again to give you an example. Then we talked about do you have one meeting per book, one per chapter, or is kind of as many as it takes. Groups have had some success with that too, with just go through the book and let the discussion go naturally and, and you decide when you've had enough time to discuss it based on how many meetings you've had. The big thing is to be consistent so that members can plan for their plan to meet. Again, we've, we've kind of migrated to the last Tuesday of the month. And so that gives people a chance, to, when they have control over their meetings, to avoid that so that they can par participate in the small group discussions. And of course, the frequency will affect the meeting length. We've had good success with meeting monthly, and then we meet normally for about an hour and a half. Certainly, if you're meeting weekly, you'll probably want to have a, a shorter discussion, for example. So how do you go about choosing books? Well, if you have a theme, stick to that. If you're, if you're starting with science fiction books and tying those to Bible studies as we did, then you don't want to bring in a biography as a book candidate, certainly. And as we've found, it's almost better not to have a theme because then you kind of opened up the universe of, of books to be wider. But it may be that you have a particular interest in some kind of books be it biographies or autobiographies, and then go ahead and stick to that because, again, that's what the group is focusing on. You have to agree on a process for choosing the books. Um, we offer candidates and vote on them, and I'll get into more detail on that just to give you an example. There's a rotation where you can just have each member pick a book. The downside of that is that you don't get as many candidate books brought in by the group. And I know in our group, even if we 
don't vote on reading a book, often many of the members will get the book and read it on their own anyway. Some of the candidates that other people have brought in. Again, you want to choose well in advance, but not so far that, that tastes may change. Um, we've changed our focus over time, and that's part of it. But a lot of it is there are a lot of new books coming out each and every month. And so if you picked your books a year in advance, you're not going to be able to pick up any of the, the new things that come up. And again, we'll, we'll talk in detail about how we've ended up doing it, just as an example. And then at some point you have to decide whether books are too long. Um, we've looked at books like Team Up Rivals, which would be a great book, but it's something like 900 pages, and especially when we're going to discuss that in one meeting, that's, we decided to just pass on that one. So. I'll just go through how we've come up with our process that's been refined over time. We pick four books at a time. So that's generally four months, although we'll skip some months. Each member is invited to submit two candidate books, and that way nobody is providing all the books that the group is going to read. You're kind of passing it around. Once the candidates go into the person who's coordinating, they'll add a link to perhaps Amazon where there are reviews and descriptions of the books available so that everybody can get a chance to look those over ahead of time. We tend not to include personal reviews very much. Um, otherwise, boy, if Sue really liked it, we have to vote for it then. You know, but, so we leave the personal reviews out, but it's been important to indicate whether the, someone has actually read the book or not. Um, you can read fantastic reviews of a book and find out that, well, it was really good for that person, but not so much for our group. And so it's very helpful if someone has read the book already. Then you send a list of candidates to the group and ask them to vote for four in their preferred order. Again, you don't have to get this elaborate if you don't want to, but this tends to work out. Where first place, we count that as 10 points, second place, nine points, and so on. And, and really, that's just trying to make it so that, for example, three fourth place votes are more important than two first place votes. So if a couple of people really like a book, that's a strong reason to read it, but it's even better if more people are interested in the same book. And then again, we choose up to four books at a time, but we've gone so that we require a three vote minimum, and our group of regular people right now is about seven. So if you only get one or two votes for a book, even if it would show up as one of the highest ranked ones, we tend to just wait and say, okay, well, we had one book that didn't really meet the cutoff, we'll just pick three this time, and next time around we'll, we'll go on from that. So, yes? We were just thinking that it looks like perhaps an engineer had something to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, guilty as charged. <clears throat> and again, like I said, you don't have to be this elaborate, but it's, just, it's an example and it, and it seems to work. I'm trying to keep your goal. Uh, okay. So, picking a host. <clears throat> I've heard of some groups where one person hosts all the time. Or if you have a little larger group, uh, certainly Zumbro is willing to offer rooms that can host your group. What we've done, and again, just as an example, is we ask people who would like to host this month. So it's not a strict rotation, but whoever's schedule it fits in best with can decide to host. And we've, I think we've only once had to come up with a room and then we got a host at the last minute anyway. So perhaps not everybody will want to host that unless you really think that's important, it's really not a requirement. It's just people who are willing to, to host the group. And we found over time that keeping it simple is the best. Um, a simple beverage offer so people can wet their whistle. But we really don't need to serve meals or desserts or lots of things like that. For one thing, it's a lot easier to host than you're, you're asking people to host, so you'd like to make it very simple. And it gives you more time to discuss the book, and that's what you're there for in the first place. So. They just need a reasonably quiet and comfortable spot to have your discussion. Group member responsibilities. This is kind of an important one, I think, to think about ahead of time. 
Um, consider a group covenant and privacy. One of the really good things that Pastor Vern has brought to the congregation, I think, is this notion of a covenant for various groups, committees, and, and teams within the church for the staff. And it's really an idea of deciding ahead of time on some rules for how people will treat each other at the time and what kind of privacy they expect from the discussion. Especially as you've been with a group for a long time, people will bring into their into the discussion their personal experiences and such, and it would just be nice if everybody understood what the expectations are for that in terms of whether that kind of information would ever be shared outside the group. So just a good thing to figure out ahead of time. Another important one is to read the book before the meeting. Uh, and there are times where that just can't happen. Uh, people are too busy, and we found that even if folks have just started a book, it, it's certainly worth coming to the meeting anyway. But of course, if you can read the entire thing ahead of time, that'll work the best. You want to participate in the discussion per the group size. And by that, I mean, let's say you're going to meet for an hour and a half, and there are seven people in the group. If you have things that you're going to talk about for half an hour, there aren't seven half hours in that meeting time, so not everybody's going to get an equal chance. So you kind of just view your discussion as what kind of fraction of the time should I talk and let other people talk the rest of the time. By the way, we've had no problems with that, but it's just something I bring up. So. Uh, really listen to understand others' perspectives. As I mentioned right at the beginning, that's one of the huge benefits of having a small group discussion, is just getting a different viewpoint. We all come with different history. We read the book differently, perhaps. We're in different stages of life and mood. And so everyone has something to contribute to the group. But you don't pick that up unless, of course, you're listening to try to understand that perspective. It's important to put meetings on the calendar and set time aside. And I touched on that earlier with it's nice to have a kind of a fixed time when you're going to meet so that people can plan ahead and try to avoid other conflicts when that's possible. Of course, sometimes it's not possible, and so you need to inform the host and, and coordinator. And what happens very occasionally is that people end up having to, or we've had to end up canceling meetings in part because the weather was so bad, for example, or we just didn't have a quorum for that meeting. So it's just nice to let people know ahead of time so you don't have one or two people gathering to discuss the book. And then respond promptly to communications. Again, if someone's trying to coordinate when you're going to meet, who's going to host, which book you're going to do, uh, the faster you respond to that, the, the smoother the whole process goes. Discussion approaches, I think it's really important to open and close with prayer. We're inviting God into our discussion then, and I think it really sets the tone for how the, the whole meeting will go. You want to have prepared questions or have a free-form discussion. And here I think, um, especially when you're starting a group, it may be a good idea to have some prepared questions so that you kind of break the ice and people know exactly what to talk, with, talk about. Our group has migrated so that we almost always have a free-form discussion unless one of the book one of the books that we're discussing hits you know, very close to home for someone, and then maybe they'll prepare some things that they'd like to point out ahead of time. And then some groups need a control mechanism for who has the floor, where they could just go around the room, and each person has a, a turn. You could have a single baton that people hand off, and you can't talk unless you've got the baton, for example. Um, the meeting leader can just call on people to participate. And again, those are kind of mechanisms that are, you're more likely to need just when you're starting, perhaps. Um, again, we have a free-form discussion now, and we really don't have any issues, especially as after you get to know people a little bit. So. It's really important to be able to build relationships with people. Um, again, some of us have been meeting for almost eight years now on a regular basis. You have that ongoing discussion with people, talking before and afterwards, even about uh, more personal situations and such. And you share a lot of books to begin with. That's how you got started with the discussion. Really a chance to, to build good relationships. 
there's a famous quote, and I will apologize to all the therapists in the room, that's, I don't need a therapist, I have a book group. <laughs> you might also want to consider additional interactions, whether you meet for another purpose, like getting together for a meal or having some summer fun activity. Um, you could have group emails, text, some, some can even have a Facebook page that they set up for themselves if you're interested in that kind of thing. And you could just explore other common interests. Again, as you get to know people better, it's pretty clear what kind of other interests people in the group will have, and, and maybe you want to explore those further with some or all members of the group. So, questions about groups. Again, really nothing very profound here, just I, th I thought it might be helpful to just collect a bunch of tips together so it's a little easier for somebody who's thinking about starting a group. Paul, how oh. easy is it for somebody to break into a group? Are they invited? I mean, are new people invited in? Uh, with ours, we have a, a web page, and I'll show you a URL for that, that does invite people to come in. Um, one thing that we've run into is that people will either hear about our discussion because they've read a particular book, and so maybe they want to come to just that discussion, and that's worked out very well, um, and, but they have other commitments or something, so they don't want to be uh, regular participants. So uh, certainly it's, when you have an established group, one of the challenges then if someone comes in is to be open and hospitable, but um, at least with our group, that's, it's worked out well when we've had people come in. I was just yep. going to point out, if, if somebody wants to join the group, the first issue is where is the meeting? So you're going to have to go through content, you know, because it's not posted, you know, where the meeting will be. So if you want to join the, co the group, you have to contact somebody and find out when, where, when and where it is. Yeah, and again, our, our Zumbro webpage talks about that. Because we're, we haven't picked the meeting spot ahead of time, and, you know, we're not trying to have a secret meeting place or something like that. But, but we just haven't picked it ahead of time, and so there's contact information on the page if other people want to get a hold of us. So. I'm just having a, uh, something in my pocket in my head. When I, before I joined the group, I, I'm a uh, practicing uh, introvert who reads lots and lots of books, and then I have these incredible discussions in my own mind about these books and so joining this book study was an incredible thing for me in terms of uh, hearing other people's opinions and realizing that there might be other perspectives on things besides all the things that float around in my head that get a little crazy sometimes so it's been a it's been a real uh, expanding my horizons experience to be a part of the book group plus all of the books that people read that I've never heard of before, or, or the places they search for books that I've never heard of before. So it was helpful in that way too. Thanks, Arlen. So, book list, you can't read this. The, the information will be published on the web, so you can get the list afterwards if you'd like that. Or if you'd rather not go through a web page, feel free to just contact me and I can mail it to you. first book was called Wrapped. <clears throat> it's not about the rapture, it's about what people focus on and how that affects their lives. And I'm going to do something you're not supposed to do with discussions, I'm going to be reading a lot of this because to try to give you a flavor of the book, I tried to pull in quotes that seemed representative or seemed important to me. So Winifred Gallagher says, your ability to focus on this and suppress that is the key to controlling your experience and ultimately your well-being. Attention distills the universe into your universe. Again, if you think about that, if you think of all the things that are going on just in Rochester, to say nothing across the country and the world, you only have a certain amount of time to think about things and focus on them, and so the people you talk to, the items that you choose to pay attention to, the TV channel you watch, the radio broadcast you listen to, any of those things are your choice of where you're going to put your attention and what you're going to spend time on. And that affects not only your experience of life, but even how your brain works together over time. 
is one of the, the points that Gallagher brings up here. The inextricability of thought and emotion is one of psychology's most important discoveries. I think a lot of us try to say, well, there's an intellectual part and an emotional part of us, and that's really not the way it works in our brains, especially with saving memories for things that you can consider later. One that's really key for me and I don't do a good enough job with, when I can't fathom something that a dear one has just said or done, I try to remember that he or she focuses on a different world and asks for some illumination. How many times have you shared a meeting with someone, a movie, any kind of experience, and you talk about it afterwards and it's like they were in a different place? <laughs> I mean, seriously? But it's really what that person ended up focusing on. Some people will focus on the emotions in the room more than what gets said. Some people will focus on the facts, for example. And so it's just very helpful to understand that each individual, because of where their focus goes, experiences things differently. And so if you don't understand something, you can ask for that perspective. The Gift of Years, this is by Joan Chittister, and I came across this book uh, when Duane Hoban wrote a, a review for it, actually, and put it in the, the Zumbro Current, another good way to, to share book information. She says, our spiritual obligation is to age well, so that others who meet us may have the courage, the spiritual death, to do the same. So there we're being examples as we age. Sorry, experience is what gives an older person the right to bring not biography, but history to a situation. So it's not all about making it personal, but boy, experience can really help others get through difficult or challenging times. A great line, this is the time for melting into God. Don't we wish we can all do that at some point where our focus is really on God and not on us at all. Neurological research now confirms that old brains are indeed physically smaller, but no less intellectually competent. <laughs> Others share my joy at reading research like this. I do have a little bit of bad news with this one. As you age, things do slow down a bit. So you don't want to get into a, a Jeopardy situation with somebody who's really younger. But otherwise, you're still capable of learning the languages and, and learning anything that a younger person can learn. And again, I found that tremendously uplifting. <laughs> Down deep where our souls live, we stay forever young. What a great point. How many here have wondered when they're going to grow up, like I do. <laughs> I, I haven't made it yet, and, and I think this captures it. Seeing gray in a world of black and white, there was a, Pastor Byrne led a discussion of this one earlier, so people are probably a little bit more um, attuned with it already. But some good points. Any issue about which thinking Christians disagree likely has important truth on each side of the debate. Humility is essential to Christian faith. Because how else can we believe that others have things to teach us? How else can we understand that God is in control and we aren't? The world of gray requires that we show up and be present. It does not afford us the luxury of putting life on the automatic pilot. This was Byron Williams with his book. Again, it's just harder when you have to stop and think about situations rather than just making decisions based on political party or a certain belief that you have without ever considering this particular situation and its nuances.
again, another one that's personally challenging for me because it raises the bar, I think. There are a host of things I seek to avoid, avoid in life, not because participating in them would harm anyone else, but because I don't believe they would honor and please God. Again, for me, that really raises the bar on things I should be thinking and doing. The Gospel of Grace by Dr. Mark Wickstrom. Really, the point of this one is that he talks about how different texts within the Bible can be described using the metaphor of a house. His view is that grace is the heart of the Bible, so that the foundation and framework, Gospel of Grace, is the heart of the Bible, and it's true for all time, for all people. Again, not everyone will agree with the perspective, but I think he has a, a very good point to offer. So that's the foundation, and the basis is grace. There are some texts and interpretations that are more like interior walls. They might even be timeless truths for some groups. They might emphasize group choices, but the house is intact if you move the interior walls around. If you still have that foundation of focusing on grace in the Bible, you still have a viable house. And so we shouldn't be as concerned about how people, other people decided to divide up the interior of the house. He goes further and says that some texts are like furnishings. There are cultural norms of a particular time. They're more personal opinions. And while such interpretations add color, they can change with no effect of the house because they don't affect, again, the foundation of the back wall. And Dr. Wickstrom says, God's word is a living document. We do not have to agree about every interpretation. The spirit can lead each of us to a different conclusion, and we can nevertheless have loving and encouraging conversations. Crossing the Bar, this is a story of a <coughs> former pastor who, based on a number of circumstances, changed and decided he would own a bar instead. And people knew about it, him being a pastor and would come to him for, with discussions. And so a lot of this book is a story style, as I put in the, the quick summary that we didn't look at much, talking about his particular situation and, and the insights that he's come across. Grace frees us each and every day to be fully alive, to be who God meant us to be. A great one that I, again, have struggled with but try to keep in mind is assume that God is already at work in the life of every person we encounter. We develop language, rituals, and ways of doing things that are intimidating to first-timers. Here we have a, lit, uh, a rich history and liturgy as part of our service. But if you think of someone coming in for the first time, wow, I mean, there's a lot going on there that they haven't experienced yet. And it's good to keep that kind of thought in mind as we're trying to reach out to people. This is where peace is finally found, in a relationship with a God who loves us enough to come after us. Many times, this is what church people need to share with bar people. And again, Johnson is not trying to draw lines between people. He's just talking about people whose experience is regularly attending church, or maybe regularly going to a bar. And in a lot of cases, they're looking for the same thing. They're looking for relationships. Making Sense of the Christian Faith, uh, David Lowe's. This is a conversational discussion of key Christian ideas and doctrines. This one, it's different because he sets it up as really someone who's interested and someone who's a mentor. The mentor doesn't pretend to know everything and in fact learns things through the discussion. But the whole book is set up as a conversation between two such individuals. And so that can take a little getting used to. I know when I first started reading it, it was very, very difficult to, you know, it's not what a book was like, right? But, but I found 
as I got into it, that it was a very effective way of explaining things. And so one of the things that we've done is actually given this book to some of our godchildren. Not so much because we think they need it, although they, they may, but as a good way to think about talking with other people about their faith. At its best, church prepares you to go out into the world, the place where God is waiting for us to join in God's work of blessing and caring for the world. And then he says, being faithful to God doesn't have to be heroic. There are opportunities to do God's will, to be God's people all around us. The reason for God, this is from a, a pastor who has a large uh, congregation in the eastern part of the United States, and regularly, after services, will invite people to come and ask questions and have discussions on whatever topic they'd like to have. So he says that we should answer and ask hard questions about our beliefs. That a faith without some doubts is like a human body without any antibodies in it. If something comes up that stresses your your beliefs, it's great to have thought some things through and had some doubts. And that can help you deal with other people as well. He also has good discussions with people who come in that are very skeptic about faith in God. And he says, to be sure that miracles cannot occur, you would have to be sure God didn't exist. And that's an article of faith. So he can really makes a good point about turning the question around there. A fish is only free if it is restricted and limited to water. Freedom is not so much the absence of restrictions as finding the right ones. I haven't found all the right restrictions yet. I don't know about you. Any clo uh, closing of the summary here is, hearts are unruly things. And to be sure that we have put our heart trust in Jesus rather than in other things, we need to follow through and join a body of believers. There are some people close in my life that I'd really like to get this point to if I can. <laughs> Finding Darwin's God. This book, again, as I've described in the in the list is different because it has, I would call, a scientific style. He's talking about lots of scientific issues that seem to be <coughs> controversial in some religious circles. But he goes through and does a great job of explaining the underlying science, I think. And then also, as a believer, how that fits in with him. And I've just found this book uh, tremendously helpful. But you have to be a little bit interested in understanding some of the, the basics of science. He explains it very well. Certainly don't need to have training as a scientist to read the book. But Miller asserts that true knowledge is found in God's works, creation in other words, and God's word, the Bible. That science and faith are completely compatible. That evolution is very important, sound science. God is not diminished by creating with a process. If we read Genesis literally, we, we think about God doing everything with a single command. But is God any less God if he set up a situation in the universe that allowed the same thing to happen? He points out that faith should not try to undermine science. There's been a long history of so-called Christian beliefs in the, in the Middle Ages about what's important, that you know the universe circles around the Earth, for example, that really had nothing to do with the Bible or faith. It's just, it was an appearance, and so somebody made a dogmatic statement, and that's where, we, where they started having problems. So he points out that faith should not try to undermine science. It should, it should be open to science. That's part of our God-given abilities. On the other hand, science should not try to explain ideas beyond its method. The scientific method cannot prove or disprove God's existence. 
It doesn't indicate what life meaning is. So you'd like to draw a distinction about where things apply. And a good summary, I think, is that science can help us recognize how God set up the universe for free will while yet allowing God to act. And I wouldn't get into the, the details here, but quantum deter indeterminacy comes into play at a, at a macro level where we experience things the size of our bodies. Science tells us how things work, and it does it very well. At the very tiny levels, atomic and subatomic particles, there are limits to what we can know. Not because we haven't gotten there yet, they're just unknowable. And Miller views this as a, a great way for God to be able to act and give us free will. Working at, at the small levels that can affect our thoughts, for example, that God can intervene and yet no one can say, ah, that proves God exists, because then we wouldn't have faith. The Five Love Languages, again, this is a book we've given uh, a godson who was recently married because it seems to make a lot of sense to try to help them out ahead of time. And, and the view here is that people have emotional love tanks that are most effectively filled when love is expressed in a way most meaningful to the individual. And I listed what he views as the different ones along the bottom there. Um, words of affirmation, quality time together, receiving gifts, acts of service, and touch. Gary Chapman says, how do we meet each other's deep emotional need to feel loved? If we can learn that and choose to do it, then the love we share will be exciting beyond anything we ever felt when we were infatuated. He does make the really good point that I think is very helpful at the beginning of a relationship that when you're first in love, you are, in effect, obsessed. That's a good thing, unless that's the way you expect to feel for the next 50 years. Because <laughs> that's not going to happen. And, and so it's, it's really nice that he gets that right out in, from the beginning and sets expectations for people. Not that love will be any different, but you won't behave like an obsessed person after a certain amount of time. When we choose active expressions of love in the primary love language of our spouse, we create an emotional climate where we can deal with our past conflicts and failures. Again, just a great reminder, this book is a very quick read, too, and so very suitable for just giving a little guidance and, and suggestion to people who are newly married. That's right. Did you give a copy of that to both? Or did you expect them to share the copy? <laughs> I expected them to share, and we actually wrote a little note about how it's important to, you learn about your love language, but you're focusing on the other person. If you find out your own and expect that to be met automatically, then you're kind of missing the boat here. So, yeah. Do expect them to share. And the last book we'll talk about is Take This Bread by Sarah Miles. Just an amazing conversion story, an example of what people can do to love their neighbors. This is a woman who was raised an atheist. Her parents were very anti-religious, in fact. She had all kinds of different life experiences, different background, but she went by a church where she could hear the service going on, and people were invited in, and she was invited to take communion. No rules about what you had to have ahead of time or anything like that. She took communion and just found herself remarkably changed, and went on from there. Sarah says, faith for me isn't an argument, a catechism. It is indeed a lens, a way of experiencing life, and a willingness to act. She started a food shelf for her own church congregation. When they outgrew that because of so many people, she actively worked setting up food pantries, a 
across San Francisco. This one person who just came into a service and was changed by having communion. She said, when I was looking at it from the outside, faith seemed to be about certainty. What a surprise. <laughs> and I think, again, that's important for us to think about, that we don't project that we have all the answers as people of faith, but we're really interested in, in exploring the questions. The point of church isn't to get people to come to church. Don't tell the pastor. No, what is it? To feed them so they can go out and, you know, be Jesus. And actually our pastors would readily agree with that assessment. What happened once I started distributing communion was the truly disturbing, dreadful realization about Christianity. You can't be a Christian by yourself. It's about the relationships. It's about loving your neighbor and loving God. So my moments of terror are almost over. <laughs> really just wanted to point out that great books are even better with discussion and that developing a small group for discussing books really isn't that difficult. There is a URL that doesn't show up on this projection very well, but again, I'll put all these out on the Zumbra website, uh, both I think in the presentation area for these adult forums and then also on our small group page. Are there any other observations or questions or books you'd like to mention or anything else? Just a, a brief comment, Paul, uh, to your uh, comprehensive review. It was very, very helpful. I've had an <clears throat> opportunity for several years of uh, facilitating a great books group for old folks. It, <laughs> the criteria is you have to belong to the LIFE program, which is uh, learning and retirement. Pay a small fee for that and a small fee for the Great Books program. And uh, it's been fascinating. This uh, month we're doing Kipling and Stephen Crane. But my comment was going to be that each of our members is an avid reader and they're reading all kinds of books all the time. We meet only once a month. So I guess my point is to emphasize if you're going to belong to a, a book group, this shouldn't be a, an exclusive uh, part of your reading. You could do all kinds of reading and then just save what you're interested in for the open discussion. Yeah, good point, Bob. We, we've had some people actually who are part of the group that um, decided not to continue participating because they don't have a lot of time to read and they didn't always want all of their reading to be you know, part of the group. But as Bob points out, if you have more time available, um, just a whole world of books opens up. And, and again, we've had a lot of success with getting candidates from other people. And even if we don't discuss them as a group, um, we can read them individually. Yeah. Great book ideas. Other observations, questions? Anne? Just that I was one of those people that, that um, came to the group because I had read a book and mentioned to one of the people in the group I read it who said, you should come to the discussion. And it was wonderful. I was warmly welcomed. And it was great because it was a book. It happened to be Take This Bread. And I'd read it and it had really changed. It had really changed me. And I wanted to talk about it. So I encourage you, if, if you find out they're doing a book, um, contact somebody and say, can I just sit in? Because it was great. So... Thanks for making that an opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to know if these books are in our library here. Do you know? I don't know for sure. I haven't checked on all. I know a number of them are, but I'm not sure about all of them. A lot of the books are in my library, if any of you <laughs> would like to read them, I'd be glad to lend them out. They're just sitting on the shelf with lots of other books, so 
let me know and be sure I write it down if I agree that I'm going <laughs> to. Just get quickie. Yeah. It's really great what you have done, and I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It's one of those things where it's just been such a good experience to be part of the group that it's just something that you'd like to share with others. Thank you, Paul. We appreciate it Thanks very much. much. We'll see you next week. <laughs>